grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Fasting is something that we don't really do anymore. It is something which has gradually slipped away, especially from our Lutheran culture and piety. But in the time of Christ, fasting was the norm. We just heard this as Jesus described it in talking to his disciples. He didn't speak to them about what they should do if they fast. He spoke to them about what they should do when they fast. But today, in our life and world, it's not so much a situation of when as, as, if, when as it is a situation of if. In fact, because fasting is so far removed from our common religious practices, fasting has probably reached the status of what exactly is that. To fast means to give up eating and drinking for a set amount of time. Not simply for the sake of becoming very hungry or thirsty, but as an exercise of spiritual discipline, or to help oneself focus in a time of prayer. Now, even though the base purpose of fasting is not just to become hungry or thirsty, this is, of course, a side effect. And we all know that it is not pleasant to be very hungry or very thirsty for any extended period of time. And we also all know that when we are in physical discomfort or pain, like would be the case if we gave up eating or drinking for one or more days, it's very hard to keep that discomfort inside of ourselves, even if we are trying very hard to do just that. Instead, it is easy to let this discomfort out in the form of wailing or making sad faces, or as it most commonly manifests itself today in our culture and language, saying over and over again, I'm starving. We've all said this, but I very much doubt that when we've said, I'm starving, that we have done so simply for the purpose of making other people aware of our physical situation with no ulterior motive. Instead, when we've said, I'm starving, like, for example, as a kid on a car trip, we're trying to make our parents feel sorry for us and pull over the car and buy us a Happy Meal so that these hunger pains which are bothering us can be done away with. But we don't only complain about a discomfort in the hope of getting rid of it. If a form of discomfort is stylish or socially advantageous, like hunger would be in a culture where fasting was the norm, then we would also be tempted to advertise this discomfort to others in order to show them that we were so hungry and so pious, so much more so than other people. This is what Jesus is warning against in our gospel lesson. The idea of putting on a great outward show of repentance so that we can gain the favor of men, instead of what repentance is supposed to mean, an appeal to God for his good favor. You can't have both, but you can have one. In fact, you are promised that you will get one. If you in your lives seek to gain the favor of the world and you bend your thoughts and your actions and your values to that end, I am sure you will get what you want. Or, if you come to God in repentance and ask Him to forgive you of your countless sins for the sake of the suffering and death of Jesus, you will get God's good favor because Jesus has guaranteed that by what He did for you in living and then dying on the cross. But again, you can't have both because both require entirely different forms of adoration. So what is on the mantle of your heart? I'm not talking about what is on the literal mantle on your home, the thing you put on display for your guests to see. I am talking about what is your heart set on? Is it set on the things in the favor of this world, or is it set on the things in the favor of God and the world to come? Jesus tells us in the verses immediately following our gospel lesson that we cannot serve two masters. Either will be devoted to enjoying the blessings of this world and their master, the devil, or we will be devoted to enjoying the blessings of the life to come and their eternal master, the one true God. So what do you want? I hope that you all want the right thing. You want God's favor. You want God's forgiveness. Even more than that, you know that you need God's forgiveness because without it, you are nothing but a lost and condemned creature. This is a hard but necessary realization that we all have to come to. We all have to look at ourselves long and hard 
in the mirror of the law of God and see reflected back at us all the times in our lives that we have not lived up to what God demands. We all need to be reminded of the fact that we have not only stayed with God. We have all set our hearts on something else, some other thing of this world, whatever it might be. And we have chased after that thing at the expense of our relationship with God and our making use of his saving means of grace. So knowing this, what do we do? God tells us what to do. We just heard him say it in our Old Testament lesson from Joel. He says, come back to me. No matter why you left or for how long you've been gone, no matter what you left me to chase after, come back to me. And God says this to us and to all people in a very specific way. He says this to us in Christ. Christ is the only way back to God. Christ himself tells us this in John's Gospel, chapter 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Imagine God being surrounded by a huge, impassable wall. And that, law is, and that wall is the law of God. We cannot get through this wall. We can't get through God's law because we have not kept it. God's law, of course, though, is not the reason why we can't get to God. Our sins are what cause that. But because we are sinners, we cannot get past the law. Because God tells us in his law, be perfect as I am perfect. Jesus, though, is the door. Through Jesus and through believing in him, that is the one and only way back into God's love and favor. This is because Jesus was perfect. For the whole of his earthly life, Jesus lived like we have it. He never put his relationship with God on hold to chase after some earthly thing. Jesus remained faithful to God by always having his heart set on God and his will. God's will for Jesus and God's will through Jesus for all people. Even as Jesus lived a life free of sin, he knew that he would one day suffer and die as a sinner. And he did this. He died on the cross in our place. Jesus endured the thing that we all fear the most. He willingly removed himself from the blessings he had genuinely earned in his life, and instead he took on to himself suffering and death. Now because of this, there's nothing more that has to be done in order for you to get to God. Jesus is the door. The wall of the law is still there, but Jesus has created the one and only opening. And this door is open all the way for you. All you have to do is, well, all you have to do is nothing. You can't do anything. Just believe. Don't not believe. Let Jesus pull you back to God through himself by the power of the gospel. When you get there, you don't even have to look sorry. You have to be sorry, though. We all have cause to repent, but repentance isn't here. It's a matter of faith. It's something which God sees. It's not out here something that we do with our faces or with fasting or with anything like that that we do to show other people how entirely sorry we are. This is not to say, though, that everything outward is bad. For example, in a few minutes, you will all have the chance to receive on your forehead an ashen cross. Now, in doing this, you are not giving in to sin by allowing me to apply this to your forehead as a mark of your absolution. The ash cross is simply that, a mark of your absolution, a sign that you are forgiven, and also a confession of exactly how and through whom you are forgiven. All of us are forgiven and brought back into God's grace through Christ and his death on the cross. And it is no sin to confess that in what you do or in what you wear. It is just as wrong to have a cross of ashes on your forehead as it is to wear a cross necklace or to make the sign of the cross on yourself or to have the cross up here at the front of the sanctuary. It's not wrong at all. It's an entirely good thing. Just as you're being forgiven of your sins and promised heaven is an entirely good thing. And probably the most important thing about having the cross on you and in your life, not just today but every day, is that it reminds you what your treasure really is and where it is, especially when we are tempted to all forget. The best thing about you or any of us is who we are in Jesus. And the best thing that you have is something that you don't actually have yet, 
something you've only been promised by God, the resurrection from the dead, and eternal unity with him in heaven. But you have not only been promised this by God in the sense that it's lacking, because we know that God's promises, his plain words, are more real and more powerful than anything this world has to offer. It was only by God's word that he made you. And it was by the, by the sacrifice of the word made flesh that God saved you from your sins. And through the power of his word, God has now brought you back to himself. So treasure this. Treasure Jesus and his gospel. And in the gospel, God will keep your heart set on heavenly treasures until that day comes when you find yourself enjoying them. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.